Good evening. Welcome to Woman. Our topic for this evening is the Equal Rights Amendment. This very controversial issue has been raging for some time now, and we're going to try to clear it up a little bit for you. My guests for tonight are Anne Scott. Anne is on the National Board of Common Cause. She's a Vice President in charge of legislation for the National Organization for Women. She's a member of the Women's Advisory Committee to the Secretary of Labor. She's an Associate Director of American Association of Higher Education. And my other guest is Karen DeCrow, who is a lawyer, author of Sexist Justice, and A Young Woman's Guide to Liberation. She's also chairperson of the Politics Task Force of Now. Just for the record, how does the Equal Rights Amendment read? It reads, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Twenty-six very simple words. Which Reverend Billy Jean Hard just said would lead us to the brink of hell. Right. How did it all start? The Equal Rights Amendment? Yeah. Um, the Equal Rights Amendment has been in Congress, was in Congress for 50 years before it was passed. And uh, it was first introduced in 1920 after the Suffrage Amendment had been passed. And uh, the National Women's Party felt that the way to gain legal equality um, and legal and economic equality for women and to erase the inequities under the law was to introduce an amendment to the Constitution of the United States. And it languished in Congress for lo those many years until it was passed on March 23rd, I think it was, in 1972, and went to the states for ratification where it is now. I think that's very startling because I had no idea that it had been around mm -hmm. that long, and I think most people didn't. I had never heard of it until I went to a NOW conference and it came up in 1967. Was that the first time it had come up? Well, I believe it's the first time it came up at a National NOW conference. Yeah, and that was a long time ago when we were all young. Uh, <laughs> and the National NOW conference in those days, I think, had about 90 people in it. This was a very controversial issue because in those days, many of the union women who were involved in National Now felt that they would have trouble with their unions. Mm -hmm. In those days, very few unions were supporting the ERA. So there was quite a discussion. That was the first time I'd ever heard about it. And I must say, it was the first time I ever realized there wasn't constitutionally equal in my own country when it came up. You know, we started to debate it at this conference. I think um, re after that, of course, I read some history on it. And I guess what the women were thinking in 1920 was, even though we had finally the vote, there was just such a huge number of laws and judicial decisions that were so anti-women and so discriminatory that we really needed a constitutional amendment. Before we get into uh, the legal aspect, let's talk a little bit about the history of, of the states ratifying it. Well, we have 30 states which have ratified and we need eight more. Three quarters of the states have to ratify in order for a constitutional amendment to be part of the Constitution, so we have eight more states to go. And there's a time limit, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted to go back to what Karen said about the laws. Um, even though there have been some strides in the law for women, there are still, in the U.S. Code alone, 876 separate discriminations on the basis of sex, which uh, discriminate against men as well as against women, um, not to mention all the thousands of state laws which are inequitous and iniquitous, and the local ordinances also. All of those will be affected by the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. Yeah, changed. we could say there are tens of thousands of laws. Mm -hmm. Let's let's name a few. Can well, you, you know, um, uh, under the U.S. Code, there are um, inequities, of course, in the Internal Revenue Service. And one of the very interesting stories that we got into was that um, there was recently a case in New Jersey where a woman um, sued the Internal Revenue Service, saying, you know, that she had been discriminated against under the Internal Revenue Code on the basis of her sex. And the Internal Revenue Service, of course, turned the, the case over to, to the Department of Justice, which acts as the government's lawyer, mm -hmm. which said, came up with a perfect defense. And it said, well, of course you're discriminated against on the basis of sex under the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, that's not the only place that people are, dis women are discriminated against under the code. So they uh, got them all out, including all the citations, which was very nice because they did their work for us. And uh, the now legislative office has a program where we have um, uh, asked lawyers if they would be interested in in writing up um, a proposal to change the separate discriminations on a piece by piece basis, and uh, so we're starting to take them around Congress now to write chairpersons, committee chairpersons, and say, 
look what's in your title of the code, please do something about it. It's an enormous job. I mean, I think mm -hmm. most people don't really realize. Yeah, it's being done state by state, too. I know Maryland did it. New York is thinking of doing it, I hope, soon, in anticipation of the fact mm -hmm. that, of course, the ERA will be ratified very soon. Then the states have two years in which to get their uh, laws into shape. And so various states are forming commissions to go through the, all the state laws and find out you know, how people are discriminated against on the basis of gender. Things are really, although much better than, you know, they were in 1920. Very grim, the uh, Supreme Court just handed down a decision that has me in a state of shock. I don't know how you feel about it. But uh, they ruled in mid-November of 1973 that a men's grill in a hotel in New Orleans, Louisiana, could continue to be a men's grill. And uh, it was God help us, an eight to one decision, only Douglas dissenting. And this is an area that I had assumed was concluded. We had in now, in like 1968, all kinds of actions on public accommodations. And mm -hmm. for example, we changed the law in New York State, we changed the law in many states, unfortunately not in Louisiana, so that women finally were considered, you know, members of the public and people that could go into public accommodations. This, you know, is not a very interesting issue. I just assumed it was closed. So the Supreme Court has decided that, you know, if some hotel wants to decide women aren't members of the public, that this is okay. So although we who work in the movement and are interested in the movement and, you know, it's our lifeblood and so on, feel that things are getting better, in very significant places like the U.S. Code, like Supreme Court decisions, apparently women are not people still. Then you would really violently disagree with the people who say we don't need the ERA. Mm -hmm. Violently. Very right. much so. Corporations are people, but women are not under the Constitution. What are some of the opportunities that the ERA, the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment, will provide for women? Well, uh, first of all, let's not say we'll provide for women because the opportunities will be for both men and women. Uh, the, when it says, the, when the amendment says that, the, that rights shall not be denied on the basis of sex, it means that some of the inequities, for instance, in Social Security, um, which discriminate against men, will also be erased. So it means simply that, what it really means is that people will be, de be looked at in terms of their own individual worth rather than simply classified in terms of whether or not they are men or women. How does uh, Social Security discriminate against men? This would wipe out that inequity and allow men and women each to retire at 62 on the same basis, mm -hmm. or at 65 on the same basis, as well they should. Social Security discriminates, I think, more heavily against women. Who, How? A woman who's worked all her life and has put money into the Social Security pool, if she's married at the time that she retires, only gets a percentage of what she's put in, which is, you know, just plain old. Mm -hmm. economic discrimination. I think the major effect of the ERA is going to be economic and is going to put more money in the hands of women. Women today still earn about 60 cents on the dollar. This is a boring statistic everybody quotes on every program, but it still is true. And uh, so these laws are not enforced, and this is in no way to make a so-called anti-male statement, but all this enforcement mechanism is in the hands of people who are male, who are not feminists for the most part, and who um, have not made sure that despite the fact that since 1963 we've had laws protecting women in employment that women are getting the same amount of money. There are also in the various states which do control labor legislation for the most part as far as who can work where, prohibitions on women say working overtime so that you'll find that in factory situations, I know all over New York State, uh, the high paying factory jobs will be eliminated to women. Women, just one example, cannot be bartenders in many states but can be cocktail waitresses. So that means they're in the same place, the same time, earning less money. This kind of law will be erased. Also I think it will create a climate so that there will be no out, this is speaking sort of legally, but Right now, very often, sex as a class is considered a reasonable distinction. And I think if the ERA is uh, finally an amendment to the Constitution, that will no longer be possible. And it will be a suspect classification in every case. And there will have to be, as they say, a compelling state interest in order to make this classification. Mm -hmm. I think this will be very significant. And w aside from Social Security and the economic situation, what are some of the other 
Well, I think there's going to be, of course, a tremendously powerful psychological effect. The interesting thing about the Equal Rights Amendment to me is that it is a, creates a situation of what I call ecumenical feminism. That is that women across all kinds of religious, social, political um, barriers are agreeing and are banding together to um, achieve ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. The um, lists of groups in the states that have gotten together are sometimes very astounding. They include uh, uh, very far out feminist groups with church groups, Democrats and Republicans, um, very um, conservative women's groups and very mm -hmm. uh, more radical ones. And they're all working together, each using their own tactics, understanding that uh, passage of the Equal Rights Amendment depends upon a wide variety of tactics and that each group has to work in its own way. And um, I think that the coalitions that are being forged and the um, recognition of common interest in the issue is going to create a situation where women will be working together on issues of mutual concern far beyond passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. There's another aspect to that, uh, just as every rural Georgia legislator at least now has to contend with these concepts. It also, I think, is an extremely conscious raising issue for women because in the debate, I think women hear often what their legislators think of them and think, uh, and what people that they hadn't assumed were so-called anti-women. Do you have some examples? You mean if, yeah, well, um, of course, the, you know, the arguments get uh, very ferocious in some cases. Yes, I know. And <laughs> there are a number of religious arguments. God meant for women to stay in the home. Maybe and, she did. Um, uh, if if um, if men if women were meant to not to stay in the home, then they wouldn't have been created from Adam's rib second and so forth. You know, I mean, the arguments get very silly. Of course, the bathroom argument is raised all Where the time. Where is the bathroom argument? That the Equal Rights Amendment will require desexification of. Uh, public facilities, which of course is nonsense. That's the a good constitutional one. right to privacy prevails. Grown up men actually discussing this, you know, the horror of integrated bathrooms, especially grown up men who've lived in a family situation, probably used integrated bathrooms. Uh, I think they must go click and say, my goodness, you know, where is it at? Also the opponents of the ERA have said it's a communist plot, said it's a Jewish well, plot. Well, let's, let's define yeah. the opposition. Can, can you do that? Well, the opposition is very clearly politically defined, and I think this became very clear about a year ago. Um, the Equal Rights Amendment passed through a number of states with very little opposition, but around last October, November, some opposition began to surface from some strange fringe groups. Um, one is called Happiness of Womanhood, which was how as opposed to now, right? and um, uh, a number of right-wing groups, uh, including the Ku Klux Klan, the um, John Birch Society, um, the National States Rights Party, which is a white supremacist organization, um, groups of this caliber, the Christian Crusade, uh, groups of this caliber were the ones which were opposing. And uh, on the other side, we had uh, the Democratic and Republican parties, a number of labor unions, a uh, number of church group, the uh, uh, Church Women United, the YWCA, um, the League of Women Voters has recently come in, Common Cause, uh, and so forth. Uh, and I think, you know, our strongest suit is simply to look at those organizations which support and those organizations which oppose. The opposition is extremely highly financed. There is one uh, very curious uh, political alignment, that is that the Communist Party of the United States opposes the Equal Rights Amendment <laughs> along with the John Birch Society, which is, you know, very interesting. And uh, Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I was reading some stuff by Samuel Gompers, and he very early, like in 1920, recognized that so-called protective legislation wasn't really to the advantage of women. And he talked about how we needed protective legislation for everyone, mm -hmm. which is, of course, what we're saying now. Th the women's movement was kind of divided. Some women felt, as I guess the Communist Party felt, that this was something that we needed. And other women, uh, Jill, uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman is just one that comes to mind, thought that any time you were going to make gender distinctions, it was not going to be to the benefit of women. You know, So this is just sort of a debate that's been raging. Actually, just to stress what Ann said, the victory of getting the AFL-CIO on our side is just 
an enormous one. Yeah, we well, it's imagine. one that we worked for very hard, and that uh, the union women within the union itself, within the unions themselves, worked very hard on their unions. There was an interesting inside-outside alliance of, of forces which did bring this about. We raised the political issue. Um, we pointed out that most of the organizations which opposed uh, the Equal Rights Amendment had right-to-work positions, and um, this political argument, of course, was one that the unions were very sensitive to and aware of. I think it's going to have a tremendous effect, and I think it's the right kind of thing. And you feel that the Equal Rights Am Amendment will pass? Do you have a date? Um, go I out believe it'll pass by 1975. I think we will get several um, legislatures within the next, uh, starting in January to June, mm -hmm. But then, of course, in 1974, there are state elections. Right. And we will be raising now, and the women's groups will be raising the issue as an element in the primaries to try and get every legislator to take a stand on the Equal Rights Amendment, which is not going to be easy. But we are using an issue strategy rather than a candidate strategy. We do not endorse candidates. What we will do instead is try to raise the issue of the Equal Rights Amendment in every possible race and get all candidates to take a stand for or against. One of the elements in our strategy has been uh, our politi political action research book, which we have been working on. We have our members all over the country filling these out on every possible legislator and candidate uh, in the states, and we ask information on who their campaign contributors are, who's endorsed them. Uh, what issues they ran on pro and con, and we really have learned a tremendous amount of information about them. I think in some cases we have the most informed state files on state legislatures that exist. That's very valuable information. It I certainly would is. It's and it's very effective in in lobbying. For instance, if you have, um, if you find that someone has certain can, uh, campaign contributors or certain organizations which endorse, and you find that that person is a no vote, then you. Can, if the organizations which have endorsed have a proposition on the Equal Rights Amendment, you can call them up and say, get on the legislators against the Equal Rights Amendment. You also just make people nervous if they right. know. Right. There are two things that I want to ask uh, before we run out of time. There are two arguments against the Equal Rights Am Amendment that you hear an awful lot. One is that, you know, it will be terrible because women will be drafted. The other is that child support will, and alimony will disappear. Would you care yeah, to comment I'd on like that? to comment on the second because I think okay. that is the most critical thing that we have to address ourselves to. About half of the women in this country are supported by men because they're married and they're housewives and they have no other source of support. So I think that we would be wearing blinders if we didn't realize that this was a very important issue. The fact is that the Equal Rights Amendment will not take away a woman's right to support simply because a woman does not have a right to support now. The Equal Rights Amendment will not deal with that issue at all. And this is, I think, the biggest smokescreen that the opposition to ERA has put up. I think certain facts should be known because people get very nervous about the fact that women will be out in the street. Uh, one fact is, for example, that at the time of divorce, only 2% of the women are granted alimony. This is a statistic. Another statistic is at the end of five years, uh, only 20% of the people who are awarded child support are still getting it. So that you see that women are in fact not getting supported and when there's a divorce and women get the children, uh, even if the father say is supplying 10% of his income to supporting those children, the woman's working, she's supplying 100%. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I think we have to bring out is that while a marriage is ongoing, no court will come in and determine that a woman has the right to support. Husband is supposed to, in most states, supply necessaries. Uh, but this is a meaningless concept because if he tells the merchants, don't give my wife any credit, they won't. And therefore, she can't get necessaries, you know, unless he uh, deems it proper. The classic case, I guess, that we all go around citing is this McGuire case out of Nebraska, mm -hmm. where this guy had all kinds of money and land and stocks and so on. He was some kind of a nut. They had outdoor plumbing. She wasn't allowed to make long distance calls. She hadn't had a winter coat in eight years. And the court would not step in to that marriage because marriage and the family is some kind of sacrosanct thing in the law of the United States, in the various state laws. And this woman, Mrs. McGuire, and I dare say any other woman that any of us come in contact with will never have a court step in and say a husband has to support his wife. The Equal Rights Amendment, if it has any effect in this area, will strengthen the position of women in their rights to financial support. 
What about the draft? The draft, well, obviously, if uh, women want equal rights, they should take on equal responsibilities. At this point, we have no draft. But if the Equal Rights Amendment is passed, it is true that women would be drafted. This means several things. First of all, it means that for the first time, women would have equal access to the benefits that veterans uh, are entitled to, which include loans for houses, education, medical uh, rights, and so forth. Uh, but also, the question arises, women do serve in the service now, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but it also means that um, um, uh, in the service, people um, serve according to their abilities, and of course, I maintain that this means that women will all end up in the intelligence corps. There are a couple more points on the draft issue. Uh, the specter of, you know, a mother with a new baby running out into the fields is absolute nonsense, absolutely ridiculous, because at any time any group of people could be exempted. You could simply, assuming the draft was back in, we were in some big state of war, you'd say any parent with a child under six is exempted. This was done even in World War II. And another point is that I think it's a bogus issue because Congress always had the power to draft women. It did draft women in World War II. As it passed nurses. a draft, yeah. draft law for nurses, but President Truman did not sign it because it was so close to the end of the war, it was clear he didn't need it. So there's already precedents for drafting women. And so I, I think it's an I a silly issue. It's a bogus issue, but it brings up a psychological mm -hmm. point that I think is interesting. When the opponents talk about we want our daughters killed, the idea that they don't find having their sons killed equally horrible always impresses me because uh, these are supposed to be the feminine, you know, man-loving uh, women, and yet that they don't find men going to war equally horrible to women going to war, I always find sort of freaky. Mm -hmm. Well, what will the Equal Rights Amendment change for us? I mean, what are the biggest changes that you see and the most important? Well, Any that you haven't listed already? No, I think the biggest change really is the principle of equality under the law. And I think simply the articulation of the statement that women are equal citizens under the law, where they never have been in this country, will have a tremendous effect. And no municipality, no state, no federal agency will be able to discriminate on the basis of sex anymore. The executive branches cannot make regulations that discriminate, uh, which is very important. People, it's almost easy to pass laws compared to getting them enforced and they can very easily be nullified in regulations which they frequently are. I find that running the now legislative office in Washington I spend more of my time trying to get, keep the government from, from nullifying laws through executive regulation than I do trying to pass them and uh, so you always have to you know be putting out the uh, executive branch fires all the time but they won't be able to do that discriminating against women. We've run out of time. I thank you both very much. It's been very interesting and very informative. Thank you for watching. Good night, and we hope to see you next week.